Hi, I'm Bill Schmick. Welcome to Third Year. Hi, I'm Bill Schmick. Welcome back to 30 Minutes. Today we'll have part two of my education series. And by the way, if you missed part one, go to the GNAT website where you can be able to see part one of the education series. So today we're going to talk about colleges. And one of the questions I'll ask is, should colleges be free? Now, the first part of the series, we talked about education, the history of education in America how the goals and objectives of education seem to have gone by the, webs or the, by the wayside. And what remains, unfortunately, is, from what I can gather, what is the purpose of education? To get a job? Well, let's see how that's worked, okay? Um, especially when we come to colleges. Now, if you recall, back in history, the whole idea uh, of going to high school had been, it was a pathway to the American dream. Most people in America didn't go to college. I think maybe at, after World War II, the most people that went to college was about 13, 14% of Americans. The rest got a high school education, and that entitled them to entry to the American dream, their own house, their car, a family, all the good things that American promised. Ask yourself something today. What does a high school education provide you and your, your kids? The answer, unfortunately, is practically nothing. The argument is that college has replaced high school as a means to the American dream. Now, no one's going to dispute the old figures that going to college can tack anywhere from three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars a year onto, uh, not a year, three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars in a lifetime of work to your income. That's pretty much proven, okay? And so, as a result of that, and because of historical trends, many, many more Americans are going to college, okay? If we look at it, though, the college costs have increased. I mentioned that college's cost for me uh, from my daughter's birth to her graduation from uh, college, it increased uh, 400% from 1980 to 2002. And they're increasing at 6.6% a year. I also mentioned that uh, Americans spend about $100 million a year to put about 14 million kids into college. And 44% um, of students pay about uh, $9,000 a year and 36% go to uh, higher nonprofit colleges that total about 36,000 a year. But students receive an average of about $12,500 in grants and tuitions from the government. About half of that needs to be paid back. Um, so if you add it all up, student loans, programs, grants, tax breaks, credits, etc., the government is probably already paying almost half of your college tuition. And many people ask, why not pay the rest? Especially since, if the argument goes, if the government had paid and is paying for high school for these many years in order to guarantee their citizens the American dream, and high school no longer can guarantee that, but college can, then why shouldn't the government, like it did in high school, in high school students, pay for the full fare of college tuition? And you know, some people even think it's a, it's an inalienable right of Americans to get an education. Debatable, but that's the argument. Now, as I said, colleges can add 6 to 10% uh, to your annual income, and as I said, lifetime earnings estimates as, as much as 600 to a million dollars. Um, but if we look at realities today, what we're seeing now is this that the average debt that a student in college graduates with is between $25,000 and $50,000 a year. And that debt, you, if you go bankrupt, you can't write that debt off. And if your parents borrow the money for you and you can't pay it back, they're on the hook for it. And even if they went bankrupt, there's still the student debt loan outstanding. It is not forgiven. So more and more students and more and more families of students are going into debt in order to achieve a college education, which is supposedly going to achieve for them the entry into the American dream. 
Well, let's look at what's happening today, and this is where I argue we've, we've, we're falling down. 32 million adults in the U.S., or 14% of the population, can't read. 21% of adults read below the fifth grade level. 19% of high school grads can't read. I said before, the illiteracy rate, no matter what we have done, how much money we've thrown at it, has not changed in this country in the last decade. And crime in high schools, grammar schools, and now even colleges is on the increase. We've got metal detectors, we have security guards, we actually have police at the doors and patrolling the carters of our schools. Um, and at the same time, what do we get in, when we go back to college? Most students now are finding a shocking reception when they go out into the um, wage world. And that is that they can't find a job. Now, there's a lot been said about the mismatch between the college degree and the, the, and the demand for jobs in America. There are jobs today that are going unfilled. They, workers can't be found for the jobs because they're not skilled to do the work. On the other hand, there's an enormous amount of oversupply in certain liberal arts types degree, education, the arts, uh, community services, government services. People are graduating, can't finding jobs, working at fast food, working at minimum wage. They're strapped with 40 to 50 to $60,000 in debt. And their whole idea of the American dream has turned to bitter ash in their mouths and in their parents' mouth. Now, granted, I talk a lot to parents and to students about this, and I get conflicting reports. Some people are angry at the system, angry at the government uh, for putting them in debt and not having a job at the end of, of the line. And other people shrug and say, why should I even go to college? Well, there's a, there's an, there's a, asking that question, why should we go to college, is an interesting alternative because when was the last time I, uh, you uh, had to go and call it an electrician or a plumber or a truck or anything like that, carpenters? <laughs> what I'm finding is that the weight I'm getting where I live for getting an electrician is about almost the same weight as seeing a doctor. Now, at the same time, these skilled workers are in, in great demand in this country, and yet there's very few of them. Now, if you look at vocational schools, which are finally making a comeback, most of them had shut their doors in the 60s and 70s when the great boom in colleges uh, first hit this country. But now more students, more kids are starting to look at the technical schools as a viable alternative to going to college. There's still an onus on going to technical schools, and I don't quite understand that, um, but it's part of our historical culture. But here's the deal. You can go to a technical school, spend two years, learn a trade, and come out, and you're, you're making forty to $60,000 a year, while when you go to college, it's four years, you've got debt up your ears, and maybe you're making the minimum wage. So there is an argument for some students to reconsider this whole college track and look at, at things like technical schools for, you know, certain um, skills and industries. I know nursing is in enormous demand in this country, and you can learn a lot of those skills through technical skills, schools. And they're making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. I know electricians, plumbers, assistants that get out of school, work with you know a senior plumber or a electrician. In three or four years, they're making a hundred thousand dollars. In five or six years, they've got their own business and hiring their own group of assistants. It's, and we are in this country. The demand for skills <coughs> of of those natures is much higher than it is for things like. English teachers or art teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we might take a second look at the vocational schools versus colleges in the years ahead. 
And the onus on these jobs is, re I have to say, is being reduced as time goes by. So, um, as I had said before, um, Amer American education, colleges and otherwise, has really hit the skids and more and more people recognize this. If I look at uh, what's happened, say, this year in education worldwide and compared to what the United States is doing, I was shocked. It says that Amer American education ranks 29th in math and 23rd in science. That's around the world. It, U.S. ranks second out of 14 countries in general ignorance. And U.S. ranks 24 out of 65 in overall literacy. That's a real problem. And as I said, if our goal of, a, of education in this country is to get a job, they're failing miserably. And they're failing miserably in education, okay? And so I'm wondering, you know, I'm pointing out the problems, but that's great. Pointing them out is cheap. What about the solutions? And I have to admit that there are people much smarter than I, educators and so forth, that are wrestling and have been wrestling with this problem over the last two decades. And yet, there's no answer. I mean, we're testing students and the tests are becoming more and more dismal. As I said, crime is rampant. Lesson, we can't afford to send our kids to school and less and less people want to send them to school anyway. Um, and one of the reasons for this, I think, is because this age, I guess we'll call it the information age, is requiring a new set of educational goals. And maybe, and maybe, just maybe, that the old system that we had, the old educational culture, hasn't yet realized this. And so maybe that is the problem. And what do I mean by that? We'll take cutting edge knowledge this year, okay? In a, in a year or two from now, no matter what the cutting edge knowledge is, it's going to be obsolete. We all know that. Just look at your computers and your technology situation and, and you'll have to agree. Um, one of the things that is necessary today, I believe, is like in my own business, okay, it's necessary for me to absorb and relate a dozen different subjects, put them together into a comprehensive whole, and for me to express them or communicating to other people. Okay, I've been doing this for years. I take the knowledge that I learn, either in my business or wherever, and I take this very knowledge, I put it together, and I come up with practical solutions in the work world. That's what I'm expected to do. And think about it. More and more, whatever job you have, the real learning starts when day one on the job, okay? So whatever the, the information that you learned in schools, the, supposedly the basics and so forth, seemed, in my experience, to go by the wayside in minutes. And I was introduced to a whole new learning curve for my business or my sector or whatever I'm working at. And I was expected not only to be able to absorb it really, really quickly, okay, but move up that learning curve rapidly because somebody was paying me. And until I moved up the learning curve, I wasn't going to be a productive part of the organization. So the onus was on me and the expectation was on me to learn, to be able to learn how to learn. And maybe, just maybe, learning how to learn is where we should focus in our educational system. The way it is now um, is that we're taught stuff, okay, realms of stuff. We're expected to store this information, understand it, and then regurgitate it, most of which is memorization. And if you think about it, we do this over and over again, but I just said that most of that information that we're memorizing is obsolete within a year or two. And yet, we get tested and we get an A, B, or C, or a failure on the, on the basis of memorizing information that may or may not be applicable in a year or two. But that's the, the system in most of our schools. Nobody really teaches understanding the relationships between this set of facts and that set of facts. Instead, 
you're tested on isolated bits of information. If you take, uh, you know, if you take mathematics in, in college and you take statistics and you take marketing or history, you're tested on each one of those areas, but you're never ever asked to make the connection between those areas. Okay, you're, it's isolated bits of information. We're not preparing students in our schools for change. I mean, think about the change that in your lifetime alone, okay? Change is not only rapid, it's accelerating on a daily basis, not only in this country, but worldwide. Think of the amount of change that's just occurred in the last five years. And I'm not just talking about technology. So are students being educated to absorb and prepare for those changes, to meet the changes head on. I don't see it. Do you? Um, <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be teaching the subject matter in depth. But what's missing is how to integrate it across several other disciplines. And I believe that that is what's missing in the educational system. So what would I suggest? Well, if we look at the preschool, and you know there's a big trend today to put your, your kids in preschool before kindergarten, and <laughs> I know my own daughter has done this too. Um, but I think if you're going to do that, and more and more people are doing it, there should be some fundamental rules established and responsibilities. Rules and responsibilities of social behavior. Remember I told you in the last uh, episodes that, that faith, okay, and, uh, and good citizenship. That all went by the wayside. Those were goals in education, but they've somehow disappeared. They should be reinstituted, and at the preschool level. Sharing, teaching them to share, tolerate others, and compassion, compassion for others. These are the things that if you're going to send your kid to preschool, these are the subjects that matter, that are important, okay? When we get to kindergarten, and then that's where we are now, by then you should be absorbing fundamental educational building blocks. What do I mean? The alphabet. Your kids should be the, learning the alphabet. Numbers, okay? But not only that, art, music, but most important, how to listen, how to follow instructions, and the, how to get along with others. These things are missing in schools today. They are not goals at all, but they're necessary and needful in order for the we of society, how to get along with others, okay? Not, look at today, why is greed the king, okay? Or just being infamous is good enough, okay? And so many st strive for this because there's a missing in our schools. And so I think in preschool and kindergarten, these things are elementary, important. I think that we should look and approach a new primary and grammar school education, okay? And what do I mean? I mean mastering things like reading, writing, arithmetic, yes, geography, mu music, art, physical fitness, and in most important, community service, active community service plus reinforcing what I've already talked about, the fundamental values and responsibilities of the student to society, none of which, in my opinion, is introduced or presented in schools today. Instead, you've got guards on the door. Maybe there won't be such a necessity for guards and security guards and metal detectors on the, on in our schools if we start at the pre-kindergarten and kindergarten and primary school level with some of these values and attitudes towards society. So what happens in high school? Now that high school isn't gu guaranteeing you the uh, American dream, should we then somehow change high school? Yes, I think we should. And how? Well, in high school we should be mastering the tools of language, history, civics, economics, ethics, logic, rhetoric, and literature, writing, and most important, how to integrate one with the other, okay? And apply them while we're learning in high school to daily life. 
sort of like on-the-job training in high school to apply these education fundamentals and values in that situation. Now, if we did this, I think, by the time we got to college, maybe from college we could then integrate to learn how to learn to add to the subject base, cross-fertilize one to another, and prepare the student not for an end of learning, for, but the beginning of learning. Because, as I said, society is changing rapidly. The, the information that they learned in high school and, and college will be obsolete. And what's most important today is to be able to take new knowledge, to learn that rapidly, to understand it, and then apply it to a base of knowledge you've already acquired. And most important, apply it to the real world, and not simply as an academic educational process. Okay, so that's where I think we're going. Um, now, do I believe that college or high school or grammar school is delivering their promise? Okay, no. Whatever that promise may be now, and if, if some people are right, it's, you know, to, uh, to get one employed. I think that, that we've lost our way in education. So, should colleges be free? Well, yes, I, I guess colleges should be free if they deliver for the cost, okay, for us. But they're not doing that now. Students now who succeed seem to be succeeding dis, despite their education. And I think until all educational institutions understand that in today's society, we have to learn how to learn, and that's their main purpose, to learn how to learn, then by all means let government pay for it. Pay for the college, pay for graduate school, pay for grammar school, pre-kindergarten school. But we've got to do something in this country, and we have to do it now, because otherwise, those statistics I mentioned at the beginning of the show will just simply get worse, and our society will become more and more disenchanted with our educational system. But it starts with you, you at home. Thank you, and I'll see you later.